SMQBs. This is episode 185 with a semi special guest appearance all the way from Toronto. We have a Canadian joining us on Canadian Thanksgiving. Moose Jaw. Happy Thanksgiving. Boo. Canadian. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Happy to be here. All right. Let's uh, start with you then. Who do you bring into the bar this week? Oh. Um, I, I'm bringing in, this is a reference that I don't think you guys will know. So maybe Mr. Phelan, based on our conversation, I, I, I would bring in the last captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs to win a Stanley Cup. And that's George Armstrong. Because this is, is he alive. Year, no, he passed away a number bring, of years ago. You're allowed to bring dead or alive to the bar. <laughs> I, you know, I'd, I'd want I'd to sit. You realize it was supernatural. Yeah, I want to sit with him and actually understand what it was like to win a Stanley Cup in Toronto because I think this 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 could be a very special year in Toronto. So that's who I'd bring. To oh, I'm, I'm oh, going to change wow. mine now. Here I'm we gonna, go. I'm going to bring I'm gonna bring Ted Williams' head to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Cryogenically frozen. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, Rooster, is that is that really who you're bringing? No, 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 no. I'm bringing Dante Divincenzo to the bar. Oh, after, oh. after his little dust up with Rick Brunson. I mean, for God's sakes, it's a preseason game, Dante. Chill out. We still love you in New York. No, you you'll don't. All, you'll always Do be you? a Nick. Always be a Nick. Don't screw that up by getting into beefs with your best friend's dad. That's just a dumb move. Chill out. All right, Pope, who are you bringing? I'm bringing the guy behind me. One again, Jarrah, Jarrah you Jones. Keep, you're going to kill the man with the alcohol. I guess that's your plan. <laughs> well, right? that's my goal. <laughs> my goal is to to bring it, some cyanide shot. To well, I don't know if that'll work anyway. I got based on that picture. I don't know if he's alive. Yeah, yeah. I know, right? <laughs> Happy fucking birthday, Jerry. Uh, you know, maybe you I'm could kick punch. another field goal for him in celebration. Yeah. Right, yes. I'm going to punch you later, but uh, right now, uh, you're coming to the bar with me, and you're going to find out uh, what the hell you're going to do for the rest of the year with this gutless team. All right. House, what about you? Well, I think some people are going to be very happy with who I'm bringing to the bar because I'm bringing the Grim Reaper to the bar with me, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I'm asking that he visit upon Nick Sirianni uh, for, on Milk's behalf to upon uh, Billy Napier, perhaps on Jerry Jones, although I don't I want Grim to just get right over Jerry Jones, Jones was there. the Grim Reaper. <laughs> I, I I want the proverbial Grim Reaper that shows up to cut people to show up uh at the bar so we can talk about his plans ahead with Nick Sirianni. Oh, we'll get to this that. is gonna be fun today. I'm looking forward to this. All <laughs> right, I am bringing Ruth Chepengentic to the bar and Ruth Chepengentic just set the women's marathon world record at the Chicago marathon yesterday, um, running it in two hours, nine minutes and 56 seconds. She took two minutes off of the previous world record and is the first woman to ever run a sub two hour, 10 minute marathon. So uh, she's earned a, a drink or two. Yeah, she's this. drinking. Where's his problem? A fellow she's marathoner Ken- for you. From Kenya. From Kenya, okay. Yeah, Moose. Yep. In case you haven't picked up on it, Bison has taken up running lately, and it's become a heavy topic. Re retaking it up, and just for uh, comparison's sake, my ten mile time was an hour and forty six, and she ran twenty six point two in two hours and nine minutes. So, uh, <laughs> how many stops did you have on your run for a drink and a snack? None, none. <laughs> we we actually ran the whole way. All right, let's jump into it. Let's get to the NFL. Uh, House, take us away. The floor is yours. Thank you, gentlemen. I, I've missed you guys dearly. Yeah, but, welcome back. Uh, thank you. Um, I didn't intend on coming back with such an inauspicious event as yesterday's football game, but I will not be silent today. <laughs> I will not be silent. Uh, because what we have is DEFCON 1 in Philly right now. Now, you would think, why is a guy about to go off on a coach who has taken them to the Super Bowl, on a coach who has a pretty healthy winning record, uh, on a coach that apparently the players seem to be standing behind, but we have suffered through a lot of bad coaches in Philly. We have suffered through Doc Rivers, 
We have suffered through Rich Kotite. We have suffered through Ray Rhodes. We have suffered through Jim Fragosi. <laughs> this clown, this clown, Nick Sirianni, is the worst. He is the absolute worst. He is in over his skis. He doesn't know what he is doing. And let me tell you something, buddy. Let me tell you something, Nick Sirianni. You brought this all on yourself. All of it on yourself. Your job is to coach the game of football, preferably keeping your word to leave the offense to your assistant coach, Kellen Moore, who you said you were going to let call the plays and not meddle, not interfere, not have this obscene arrogance that on the most simple, simple of plays, on the most simple of downs, just go with the textbook. They're the most easy decisions. But no, you're smarter than everybody else. A wide receiver coach who never coached at any level before the Eagles is smarter than everybody else. So what do you do? You you step yourself and the team and the city down to the worst excuse for a football team in the Cleveland Browns. I mean, that team is from hunger. That team stinks. And we barely, by the skin of our teeth, got by. And it's not because the players on the field. Why is Philly so animated today? It's because we have Saquon Barkley, we have A.J. Brown, we have Jalen Hurts, we have Devontae Smith, we have Lane Johnson. With The list goes on and on and on. The fact that we are just sliding by a team as pathetic as the Cleveland Browns, but it doesn't end there because everybody knows this. When the game ended, what did Nick Sirianni do? He decided to get in yeah. with the fans behind him who were upset. With the way the team was going, with the way the game was going. And this arrogant clown decided to, to jaw. And he knew he was in trouble as soon as that game ended. So, what did he do for his post game presser? Oh, the, yeah. guy br- the guy brings emotional shields to protect him. Three kids. Uh, now, you tell me oh. how, many, how many NFL head coaches after a game will bring three kids up on their dais with them? Like obscene, but it gets worse because you guys might not have heard the latest update about two hours ago. Ooh. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read the quote unquote apology, the non apology apology from Nick Sirianni to the Philadelphia fans. I was trying to bring energy yesterday, and I'm sorry and disappointed how my energy was directed at the end of the game. I have to have better wisdom and discernment, and that wasn't the time. Listen, you jackass. It's not how your energy was directed. It's who your energy was directed to. We pay your salary in case you've forgotten. We show up in the stands in case you've forgotten. We bailed you out with a false start call at the end of the game that moved the Browns away from third and goal from the three-yard line. It was the fans that won you that game, you dick. So let me make it perfectly clear. Your days are numbered, Nick Sirianni. You have 68,000 people that show up to the games against you and millions of more in the city. You have zero room for error. Your one little toe is on the edge of a cliff. It takes the mere wind of the next loss, and you're a goner, buddy. We're all out to get you. Now we can discuss the – Wow. If if – if, Did you guys if win you, the game? Yeah, you won, <laughs> right? If you lose I mean, that game, is he fired today? Yes, yes. There are people that are disappointed that we w- that we pulled that out because he would have been gone. I just, you know, Jeff Jeff Lurie, um, he's a great owner. He is a great owner that goes out and tries to get whatever he can for this city and for that team. I don't think he stands for this kind of stuff. This did not sit well. And let me tell you, when Je- when when Sirianni did his presser today, he looked like he was a prisoner. Okay, uh, now that was in wait, a lot of trouble. Is, this is not going to be well received by one house, but I, I do want to remind you that Sirianni has a history of chirping at fans and it's just often been the other team's fans when they've been winning games and nobody in Philadelphia didn't like it then nobody said shit about it when he was you know talking smack to guys uh, uh, you know on the other teams when they I were agree losing. with you it's all childish it's all childish and let me just say this 
as bad as Pope feels about the Cowboys, I'm just going to go on record and say this. We are the worst team in the NFC East. We are going to we are going to lose to the Giants. I, no I watched. Chance. Yes, R- Rooster. Finish him off, all Rooster. Of that, I watched all of that game last night. There were some inopportune penalties. Uh, 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 a sack caused interception, but that offense that, can move. That, that that interception was thrown after he looked right at a wide open guy in the flat and decided to hold the ball instead. The offense can move. That offense is capable of moving, and you have a good defense. It's not It's not an average defense. You have a good defense. And shut down a pretty powerful offense. We are going to lose to the Giants, and I don't know what happens against the Jaguars. Maybe we beat them, and then I think we lose to the Bengals. But we are the worst. We are the worst team in the then NFC Then you got the East. Cowboys. Yeah, we'll lose there for sure. That's oh, for a way. Sure. We will, yes, for sure. <laughs> you will finally get a home win, but we are the worst team in the NFC East. And I, while I will say that Jalen Hurts is probably better than Danny Dimes and Dak Prescott, we're going nowhere. We're going nowhere with this coach, and that is what is infuriating the city is we have so much talent that's being wasted. It is so much talent that is being wasted. Now let's discuss the rest of the NFL. Well, wow, before like, we get off like, the Eagles, before it's we like get re- off the Eagles, how come it's you like haven't... reverse hold my beard? Like, no, my team's worth. No, you hold my beard. My team's worth. Why did you guys not sign Hassan Reddick? Um, we thought that Bryce Huff was a was a at least lateral move to be just as good as Hassan Reddick and cheaper. Mm-hmm. And as it turns out, Bryce Huff finally got half a sack and a tackle yesterday. Until then, he's been worthless. Hassan Reddick signed with what's his face today. Um, Did he sign Jets. with Buffalo? No, no, no. Oh, the, the Jets. No, the Jets. No, yeah, because he, he got with the new agent. What's his face? Rosenhaus. Um, yeah, Drew Rosenhaus. And he's going to fix the whole thing. Did he uh, sign already? I don't oh, know. Oh, no, that's what I was – I he, thought you were saying. He, he signed with Drew Rosenhaus today. Well. Yeah, and Rosenhaus will get it done, and he'll he'll be on board with the Jets. We miss Reddick bad. I, I told you last year, I said I hate that guy, and, and you thought I meant like on a personal level, but it was just because he was always all over the, the commanders. I felt like he was – a nightmare getting strip sacks at the worst time of the game for us. So um, I, I don't know. I, I think he's a good player. I Listen, I think that Mike McCarthy is equally bad to Nick Sirianni, but I think the Cowboys have plenty of talent on both sides of the ball. I think they will fix their issues. I think the commanders are obviously on the trajectory up. And I think the Giants, I think they've got the right coach. By the way, We'll trade almost any player on our team for Dable. If we get Dable, that would fix everything. What Dable is getting out of that putrid team is amazing, actually. You already got uh, Saquon. Just leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, well, yeah, that I, turned I do, out for him. I, I don't think we should go a second longer talking about the NFL without mentioning the Detroit Lions-Dallas Cowboys score, which was 47-9. to nine. Again, that's 40, 47 yeah. for Detroit, nine for Dallas. It was Jerry's 82nd birthday. Yeah, 82nd. 82nd birthday. And he got to see a, um, what was it? It was 47 to nine um, Dallas Origami. on the losing Three end. Three field of that. goal performance by that offense. Pathetic. So, Pope, what's the mood in Dallas? Uh, well, you know, we, we are not as, uh, I guess, artful as uh, our Philly friends as far as. Uh, a feeding frenzy on on a coach um, because everybody knows that McCarthy really isn't the coach uh, of the Cowboys. It's Jerry Jones. He coaches, he owns, he manages. It's it's him. It's he all coaches him too. Well, I mean, pretty much. Uh, you know, if, if he could, he would. Let's put it that way. Uh, and McCarthy has no real uh, power. It's all in Jerry, and everybody knows that. Uh, so you guys are calling for for uh, Sirianni's head. Everybody here is calling for Jerry's head. And they have been for a while, but it's really gotten uh, – with these four embarrassing home losses. Guys, they've been, they've been blown out in four straight games at home. Yeah, they got within a field goal of Baltimore, I guess, in, a, in the second half uh, surge. But um, halftime games have been over at halftime in, in all of those games. And they've given up – a record amount of points in the first three games uh, at home 
uh, shattering records in the wrong way. Uh, whatever they were going to do in the off season didn't work because they didn't do anything. They didn't sign any free agents. They, they let CD and Dak linger uh, and they didn't use their uh, contract re-signings to go out and get anybody. Uh, they are, they are injured. They're definitely uh, on the defense. Parsons, Lawrence, others are out. No, no question. They are not at full strength, but the performance that we saw yesterday was that of a team that has, if they haven't quit, they're about to quit, and it was just gutless. I mean, you could watch some of the players. Like Diggs, uh, when uh, Dave Montgomery was running at him, Diggs basically did the uh, ole and got out of the way. He did the uh, Deion Sanders uh, yes. tackle. Diggs yes. was bad yesterday. Yes, he, Diggs was bad. How about Zach Martin, our all-pro guaranteed Hall of Famer? Uh, he graded out at zero for pass protection. First time wow. ever in his career. Wow. So it, it is across the board. Um, God knows why they're they're running Zeke out. Rico Dowdle has his best game uh, last week. And they so they run Zeke out and they run him more than Dowdle. And Zeke gets two yards in a cloud of dust every time. And so any time any chance they had to get in a shootout because they weren't going to stop the Lions uh, was was, you know, they're trying to run the ball, which is ridiculous. And they run the ball with that running back committee is even worse so they deserve everything they got it's not going to get any better guys they play at san francisco at atlanta then they have philly and houston coming home uh they could lose the next four games very easily and mccarthy i think you lose three of those mccarthy could be out uh before uh before parsons even makes it back hope it's i watched that game and it seemed to me the problem was with the players not the coach. I, I don't understand what McCarthy did wrong. The players were outplayed. The well, the, but that a lot of that's coaching, though. You know. Yeah, that. but the Lions. It's, the Lions were pissed from last year when they lost yeah, that Dan game. Dan Campbell holds a grudge. Bad call. And <laughs> yeah. af, after the game, Ceedee Lamb and others were waving bye bye to the Lions, and they do hold a grudge. And Dan Campbell's pissed. They rubbed your fucking noses in it. Oh Otherwise, yeah. Otherwise, how do you? Explain them calling a friggin' hook and ladder to a to a offensive tackle, Panay Sewell, who scores a touchdown on the play. How do you allow an offensive tackle to score a touchdown on a hook and ladder reception? They were rubbing your in on purpose, running out no, the score, Dan, and rubbing Dan Campbell, the Cowboys' noses in it, and no Cowboy stepped up and said, "All right, enough is enough." Dan Campbell told Ben Johnson to come up with all kinds of trick fuckery. And I mean, they had offensive linemen eligible nine times. I mean, they, they they were coming up with all kinds of potential trick plays. Absolutely, it was it was the biggest fuck you that Dan Campbell could deliver to Jerry on his birthday. And it was look from the anti cowboy faction, which there are 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 many, and it's growing. It's a bandwagon of anti cowboys. Uh, this was beautiful because this sure this was. is going to cause this is going to cause chaos. Now, Jerry, you know, was asked, are you going to make a coaching change? And he said, no, that's not even on the table, not even thinking about it. But two long weeks, we got to buy two long weeks with the Dallas media pressure. It's going to get it's going to get ugly around here quick. He's not going to do a thing. He never fought as a coach in the in midseason. He, fi- he fired that- Wade Phillips 10 Fire. years ago. And then allow well, Jason Garrett to have the next ten years of mediocrity. He, he, here's here's <laughs> what the here's what the Dallas fans and the Philly fans are rooting for tonight. They are desperately rooting for a Jets win to show that you can fire a coach midseason and still turn it and turn it around. I'm telling you, if if the Jets can beat Buffalo, which I don't think is going to happen, there's going to be even more pressure on McCarthy and Sirianni. But, but that uh, happened. But that happened last year when Antonio Pierce took over the Raiders. He got them going. So what? Jerry Jones isn't going to do a thing. I don't think he will. No, he's not going to fire himself. He's the GM too. Right, but he's not going to do a thing. And you know, you know who the stupidest people are? Are well, the Dallas fans who keep buying tickets at probably at the highest price for mediocrity. But for some reason, everyone thinks it's 1990 to 1994 still in Dallas. It hasn't been for a long time. That's thirty years. Like, come on! Like no, Dallas is not I, a thank, great football. Thank you for stating the obvious. Says moves. the Leafs fan. 
with the, yeah. with, the Leafs, with the Leafs jersey on. But I, I, I think it's I, wait, wait. I appreciate Bruce's point. I'm gonna pile on Dallas anytime I can. Leave the Leafs alone. Leave, leave the Leafs alone. Uh, the fact is, why do we continue to look at Dallas like they're relevant? They're not. They're a fucking garbage franchise. They're not relevant. I mean, they're really just not. They they don't do anything when they're good. They underachieve. When they're underachieving, they go really underachieving. I I, I don't know. I mean, why do they get so much attention? It it's not America's it's team. It's not deserved. And it's why not does deserved. Dak get sixty million dollars? I mean, that he's too. not. He is not a good quarterback. Well, that's just a function I, of timing. That's just a function of timing. They're talking I'm about Sam, Dar- Sam Darnold's looking at fifty million dollars next year, apparently. I want to turn to the marquee matchup of of uh, week six, which shockingly nobody would have predicted this b- before the season started. But the marquee matchup of week six of the NFL was the uh, Ravens. border, the border rivalry between the Ravens and the commanders. And yeah. here's my here's my question to to Bison. Are D.C. fans today? patting themselves on their back for a moral victory that we paid close with the Ravens, or are you angry about losing a game? Well, man, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. It's a tough one to answer. Um, I don't think anybody, I don't know that moral victory is the right thing to say because people felt like there were some bad calls. I hate blaming the refs, but a lot of the, DC people you're, you're hearing are, are blaming a lot of bad calls. And there were, you know, I, I, honestly, at the time, I didn't think it was that unfairly officiated, but I've seen some things now that make it look like there were some really bad calls at some uh, bad times. Um, no, I don't want to say moral victory, and I hate that. But the reality is, this game two years ago would have been 40 to 12. You know, it just would have been a total blowout. I think there there is some better feelings that the franchise seems like it com- can compete. Now, look, Baltimore is one of the top three teams in the NFL. They are a, they are, you know, shortlist Super Bowl contenders. I mean, that is there's no reach in saying they they are a favorite to win the Super Bowl. And I don't think anybody believes Washington's in that their league at this point. And we got exposed exactly where we knew we were bad. Our, right, our, what you've been our, saying is your defense is not there yet. Yeah, and our secondary in particular. Our secondary could not stop Flowers. And, you know, wh- when we were able to stop Henry a little bit, it didn't matter because they could pick up 20 yards of play thrown to the ball to Zay Flowers. So moral victory, I don't think anybody feels that way really, but it is nice to see that the franchise isn't a total joke like it's been for well, yeah, and years. Well, yeah, and you have a – rookie franchise quarterback who keeps you in a game like that when the other team gains yeah. almost 500 yards against you yeah i mean you gotta love that guy Daniels. oh yeah he's he's the future yeah he looks he looks legit and and it's just his calmness and you know and there's a lot of things you know i mentioned it he played 55 or 56 college games most quarterbacks coming out of college have don't have that much experience and then this vr virtual reality thing is is pretty wild i mean they yeah. and and it's been getting a lot of press, and I think we talked about it last week. I think he's here, already so. better than two of the quarterbacks in our division. Yeah, I like, think he probably is. Well, I he sure he looks is. good on a fantasy roster. I can tell you that. I'll just say, <laughs> I, I'll just say from a guy who <laughs> probably should have won the MVP in his first full NFL season. Caution, as I've said many times on this pod before, do not build the statue yet. <laughs> this is very – I'm serious. Jalen was exactly what we were talking about at this stage of game six of Jalen's you know, NFL career as we're, we're saying about Jane Daniels. It's a long season, and then it gets an even longer postseason, and then NFL defenses start figuring it out. This is a very encouraging NFL story, not just a D.C. story, but I think we should like – and I'm sure this kid is going to stay humble himself, but that that franchise and that kid should stay humble. It's a long way to go. Still, no, no, no doubt about it. Now, I will say, and I think I I might have texted you guys yesterday, but I, I do not remember a time since RG 3s rookie year 2012 where I've seen this many shirts, jerseys, T-shirts, hats, everything. I mean, it is the city is is back to being interested, and there is a huge 
Redskins football team commanders fan base here that is just waiting to to, to have a reason to cheer. Um, you know, a couple bad years is one thing, but it has been 25 years of darkness. And so the fan base is, is pretty much ready to explode. Uh, now, you know what? Big, It's a big test next week because it shouldn't be, right? Carolina, not a good football team. Th- that's a game that Washington, if they want to be serious and on the right path, then they need to take care of business and win that game and feel like they're in control the entire they time. Will. They should, but let's see. Let's see what happens. I think uh, right. uh, for the rest of the NFL, it's just NFL be on notice. The The Bucks aren't playing around. I mean, I get it that it's Spencer Rattler and the New Orleans Saints who started off, you know, pretty dominant early in the season. I guess now the win against the Cowboys doesn't look as impressive as it did earlier in the year. But that team was up 27-23 and lost that game 51-27 to to the Bucks. The Bucks are just – a train that nobody wants to get in the way right now. It doesn't matter whether they're home. Well, or the away. Falcons don't in mind them, right? Yeah. I'd lo- I, that'll be an interesting rematch for that one. Falcons remain impressive. The uh, I thought the I thought the Packers, I know the Cardinals aren't that great, but the Packers back with Jordan love at the helm are going to be really, really tough out. Um, and I think uh, the, the what? Chargers, the Chargers. I know it's the Broncos, but the the Chargers. They've been playing uh, better. They're been they're playing better. I, I think the Chargers going to be an interesting <clears throat> story later in the season as this team gels. Don't count Harbaugh. Out. What, what about the NFC North though? You know. Oh yeah, crazy. Winter, yes. As they said in the headlines today, winter is coming. Yeah. <laughs> the freaking Bears are four and two. Can you believe that the Bears are four and two, and they and they're tied for second, third place, I guess, in the North, because the Lions are four and one. They had a bye. Yeah, yeah. The Jags are bad though. Well, let me ask you a question. Hang on, hang on. The- Let's talk about. I want to talk about the North real quick because you guys know how much I love a stat. The NFC North is seventeen and five. First time in history a division's had a seven fifty or higher through week six. The NFL leader in point differential is the Vikings at plus 61. Then the Lions at plus 60, Bears at plus 47, Packers at plus 41. Everyone in the NFC North has a better point differential than every other team in the league. Suck on that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, listen, you get one game against Dallas and that that's <laughs> that game, so that backs it up. So uh, you know, hey, but let's 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 talk about Detroit again for a second. Massive loss for them, yes. right? With yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, yeah. Oh. Sad. Sad, terrible injury. Hopefully, um, you know, hopefully it's it something that he can come right back from. I don't like it. we've seen too much too too many of those injuries in Washington, uh, albeit with quarterbacks, but uh you really worry about a break that bad and and what does that do to, to Detroit as a team moving forward? Do, mm-hmm. I mean we know their offense is prolific. How does that going to affect the defense though? It's gotta be a big loss for them to massive so sack leader. Yeah. You would think they're in the market for a trade. Yeah. Yeah, that's I mean, a big they, hole. They can, they, they can go all in this year. Yeah. All right, what else do we have from week uh, six before well, we here's, jump into – I wanted to ask you guys about this. This just came up today. Not necessarily a week six game time issue, but Tua says now that he's coming back this year to play, and the my, yeah. and the Dolphins are on board with it. Yeah. He had the same kind of reaction to the last concussion that he did two years ago when our guest doctor said that that was a sign of a deep brain stem injury, not just a concussion. This guy's going to kill himself if he keeps he is. this up. He is. And, and and along the lines of the two, uh, Chris Olave, who's what, two, three-year wide receiver, suffered concussion number three in his career. And very, very sad they're, these guys should not be playing. They are taking their life into their hands. Tua's next concussion is taking his life into his hands. It, it's it just not worth it. It's, it's not, not worth, worth it. it. Especially get in the broadcast already, booth. Do yeah. talk about football. Do something else. Yeah, you've got enough money. I mean, you have generational money. It's it's just get get out of there. Get out of there, man. Um. All right. So let's see. We've got to cover. Uh, we got to do our locks. House. I mean, man, you're killing it. What is yeah. going on? Uh, this is, I, I am 
as some of my friends know back home, I am king of the driving range. So, uh, uh, so I can do things like our Plaxico bets. I'm six and zero, oh, kind of like uh, the but, Phillies. But yes, gents, uh, we went five and zero oh as a pod last week. So we're doing good, and I think uh, I think I sent around that we are twenty and ten on the season. So for all of our listeners that had lost your money in the past on us, get back on our train. We are ready to bring you. Uh, more generational wealth. So <laughs> now, now, House, to that point, I have received a motion from a listener. Oh, oh. cousin Justin oh, yeah. has oh, made a request oh. <laughs> that we not overlap our picks; that we can't have the same Plaxico as another SMQB. That's, that's a good he, one. That's fair. He emailed me. He told me you were ignoring him, and he emailed me that. And I was, te- <laughs> I was tempted to say, "Hey." Enough, enough. He, enough he is told enough me, with the He told me two people were ignoring there. him. Yeah, he yeah. said you were ignoring him too. So. Yeah. He's our number one stand. I feel like we, we need to go with it. I think that's uh, fair. That's not fair to the people who pick fourth and fifth, though. Well, I don't yeah, think anyone's going to take my pick or, or Milk's pick. I don't think. All right. So let me st- – I all have right. Milk's – Milk can't join us because – uh, we're all praying for Milk and getting his electricity back and all that stuff that's happened in Tampa. But Milk is going to stay on the Tampa train and take the Bucks plus three and a half home against the Ravens. They are a home dog plus wow. three and a half. That's the Ravens. Be a good game. Yeah. That's a tough one. Wow. I might take the Ravens. Uh, yeah, I'll take the Ravens. I don't think anybody else is going to take this one. So I'm going to go in the interest of the cousin Justin rule. I I am jeopardizing my six and zero record by taking the 49ers minus one and a half versus the chiefs. I think they get wow. their revenge and I think the chiefs become part of the defeated group. Was anybody going to take that? No, I, don't think so. no, it's, no, I think it's, no. it's a decent pick. I said last week that the 49ers have a statement game coming up and they made their statement and they look good. All right. All right. I'm going to go against House's advice, and I'm going to take the Eagles minus three and a half at the Giants. The Giants are terrible. <laughs> what anyone says. They're terrible. <laughs> They're worse than the Eagles, the Eagles and the and the Cowboys. Uh, the reverse hold my beer bet. <laughs> no, I, I'm going to take um, the Bengals minus four and a half on the road against Cleveland because I think Cleveland is terrible. Now, I admit, I, I don't know – quite what's happening with the Bengals offense, but I, I think Cleveland is absolutely atrocious. And I think the Bengals think are going to have a pick. break breakout game. I think that's a good pick. Awesome. Well, I, the game I had picked, you nobody touched. I I'm feeling, I'm feeling it. Bison. I think the Panthers are going to get smoked uh, in <laughs> Washington. So I'm taking the commanders and given seven and a half. Wow. That's good. Panthers I think that's... suck. You guys Moose. will rebound. Moose, you want to make a pick? Guess pick? Yeah, I, I'll take uh, the Indianapolis Colts minus the three and a half against the Dolphins in, Indiana- in Indianapolis. I think that's a good yeah. pick, Moose. It's a good pick. Yeah, good pick. All right, we got to do the parlay, the SMQB parlay. Oh, how about next which, last week? Which, by the way, if you followed our advice last week, it was um, the Falcons giving six and a half. Um, what was the first? The first leg was oh, it was the. Um, it, well, the over in the Baltimore Washington game. And I think it was. Uh, I have it here somewhere. It was, was it the Green Texans. Bay? It was oh, the, the Texans. Texans. The Texans. The Texans, uh, the commanders over, and the Falcons. Yeah. And if you put 50 bucks on that, you 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 won $355. So that was a good Gen- one. Wow. Uh, Gen- generational wealth. This week. <laughs> Let it ride. Right. <laughs> Here, what, do, what do we think of this one? I've got the Bengals minus four and a half with the like over it. with the over in the Texans Green Bay game. The over being forty seven and a half. I love that. Oh, that sounds a, low. A fifty dollar bet there gets you one eighty six. You don't want to throw a third one on there to press your luck. Let's, let's not get crazy this week. We did that last week. I, I love it how our through. wager has gone right. from $20 to $50. I know. I won 355 last week. I mean, come <laughs> on. <laughs> All right. All right. Bengals minus 40 and a half and Texans Green Bay over 47 and a half, right? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yep. Got it. Yep. 
All right. All right. This is the big moment. This is what we've been waiting for. It's the Moose Jaw hockey preview. Somebody write down what he says this year so that next year we, we <laughs> yeah, don't have you to know go what? back to the tape. No, don't have to go back to Cousin Justin, who I still have yeah. beef with. Okay. All yeah. right. All right. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to abbreviate a little bit because I'm running up against Thanksgiving dinner here in uh, Canada. Um, <laughs> Happy Canadian Thanksgiving. What do you eat for Thanksgiving? Yeah, what does one Moose, obviously. Moose? Well, if you run one over on the highway, yeah. What a delicacy. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> first of all, uh, thanks for having me again. I'm happy to be here. And let's go right to the cream of the crop in each division. Uh, in the Atlantic, it comes down to three teams, the Leafs, the Panthers, and the Tampa Bay Lightning. Um, Toronto's biggest acquisition is getting rid of Sheldon Keefe and bringing in Craig Berube. Uh, I'm actually feeling optimistic. You guys know I have never been very optimistic going into a hockey season with the Leafs. This year I am. Florida's uh, defending Stanley Cup champions, uh, world-class goaltending, world-class coach. They did lose some uh, depth. If they run into some injuries, they could have some trouble. If Sam Bennett, Sam Bennett's going to be a big factor. I don't think he can do 50 goals again, but they're still pretty solid on the back end. Tampa Bay has the best coach in hockey. Um, I'm not sure how much Steve Stamkos leaving is going to affect them, uh, just because of his age. And bringing in Jake Gensel, I don't think is a solution. That being said, when you have Victor Hedman and that goaltending, you can go a long way. But I see the Leafs coming out of the Atlantic. The Metropolitan. Probably the worst division in hockey. Oh, come on. Oh, come on, man. What's worse? What's, tell me what's the worst division. To be honest, New Jersey, I know they're 4-0-1 or 4-1 and so far. They lost to the Leafs. Sheldon Keith is a terrible coach. This team might do fine in the uh, regular season, but in the playoffs, New Jersey will lay an egg. It's going to come down to the Rangers and the Hurricanes. My issue with the Rangers right now is what's going on with Shesterkin. He was offered an eight-year, $88 million contract that he turned down last week. That would have been the largest yearly salary for a goalie by $3 million. Like, wow. not, I mean, he was – and he turned that down. So I'm wondering what's going on in New York internally, uh, what, you know, within that dressing room. Uh, maybe he gets signed if he does – they're going to be fine, but he's probably the best. Um, Rangers are still solid, um, but turn that down. I still I don't understand. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. The, Canada's yeah, the starting best. to freeze. Uh, the Thanksgiving there we day. Go. Sorry, oh. guys. We had a freeze there, Moose. Karen cut the, uh, yeah. cut the connection because yeah. he's, yeah. yeah. he's late for dinner. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So it's going to come down, I think, to the Rangers and the Hurricane. Yes, I didn't mention the Flyers or the Penguins because they ain't going to be in this in the uh, playoffs this year. Boo! You can boo all you want, but you know reality is reality. You you might want you might be looking for you might want Sirianni coaching the Flyers by the by the uh, Christmas. Whoa. Wow! <laughs> wow! I hope you're familiar with the Rookie of the Year trophy in the NHL. Uh, I am. I am. And Tortorella is not one that really treats rookies all that well so <laughs> let's see if those guys are uh, crying by christmas or not um in the central i i love the blackhawks they're not going to be in the stanley cup finals they're not going to be competing for it but if connor bedard stays healthy the entire year he is the next generational player um they added a lot of good pieces over the uh over the summer i think they'll make the playoffs um nashville Stamkos, Marcia so a couple other guys that are on the back end of their careers. So in terms of big name signings, Nashville won the summer. Uh, they'll make the playoffs. Broadway's going to be fun during the summer, though I don't think they'll go far in the playoffs. Uh, but in the central, you've got the Jets, the Stars, and the Avalanche. Avalanche. Those three teams are going to dominate and come out, and I, I actually think the stars are going to come out of that. Uh, Moose, uh, yes. Um, and in the Pacific, 
Um, yeah, I'm not trying to gain favor with favor with Mr. Pope there, but I, I actually believe in Dallas this year. Dang, off um, to a good start. Yeah, they were West and finalists last year. They were um, in the Pacific. I know Edmonton's zero and three last year. They were like one and twelve. Went to the finals. It's coming down to Edmonton and Vancouver. Edmonton is the class of the Pacific. So I've got conference finals, Toronto and Rangers, Dallas and Edmonton, and Edmonton. Oh, beat- Toronto and Rangers. Yeah. I just got to want to mark this down. Toronto and Rangers and what? And Dallas and Edmonton. Okay. And I've got Edmonton beating Toronto in the finals. An all Canada final? I do. I know. When I wrote it down, I couldn't believe it. Um, the, the, <laughs> no, fascinating, the fascinating part about this season, a couple things. Connor Bedard. As long as he stays healthy, and the LV watch is going to be something to watch. Um, wait, wait, wait! Did did you did, are you are you going with the winner of I Edmonton, said Edmonton, Toronto? I said Edmonton. Yeah, you went with the Oilers. Oh, okay, okay. I said Edmonton. Okay. I said Edmonton. Um, but I got to tell you, the LV watch is on. Um, I don't know if he can get forty two this year. I think he can get thirty five this year, and. Um, uh, that'll be fun to watch if he gets if he gets hot in that fr- in the fr- first twenty games, man. He's a train uh, who will wreck some uh, nets, and I think Gretzky is going to is is pulling for him to break the record. I think uh, a lot of people are. Uh, I think he's been a phenomenal generational player. I hope he breaks the record. The MVP is going to come down to McDavid, Matthews, and McKinnon, and I think Shesterkin wins the. Uh, that's a trophy for the best goal. All right, so I, I got a question. Um, if give us three names you haven't told us right now that we should be watching throughout the league, yeah, anywhere. Three guys, if, if you had to okay. tune in and watch a game that's on, who, who do you want to see? Okay, I'm gonna tell you guys, this is a home. Town bias. Willie Nylander is number one. Uh, Nylander had 99 points last year. He's had three forty, three straight 40 goal seasons. Uh, he's getting stronger, and I think he's going to flourish under Craig Berube. He is a an exciting player. Um, I got to tell you, every time you watch Sidney Crosby, you're, I'm amazed. He's 20 Still. years in. He is 20 years in the league. He is one point. He got an assist the other night in Toronto. He's one point away from 1600. He's still like, he's not slowing down and he's in there battling. And I will tell you, um, how many brain are, cells you think that guy's lost since he started playing? Not as many as Tua. Yeah. But, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> on a but, Tua meter, on the Tua meter, where is he? Yeah. Um, and you know what? I, I, for, you know, not, because Toby's here, but I am interested to see how the two rookies in Philly do. Um, Let's go. Because what are their what and, are their names? Uh, Matt uh, Mitchkoff and Jet Luchenko. There you go. And and one of them's a tribe member. Tribe member. So uh, on draft day, Toby <laughs> texted me and asked him if I knew him. Just like Christopher <laughs> Columbus. Just yeah. like Christopher Columbus. <laughs> now, Happy. It, it, now it does. Young who let it Go now, ahead. Now now it does turn out that a good buddy of mine. Um, who I play golf with is his agent. So uh, there is a connection. It's one degree of separation. For jet. For <laughs> and, jet, yeah. And, um, but I'm interested. And, and honestly, I, I hope Torch doesn't destroy those kids. Um, Mitch Koff he is has special. A, he's, he's really he, fun he already is, to watch. But, but again, we don't know what these coaches do to these kids behind the scenes. And that's my biggest concern. Look, what Mike Babcock did, when it finally came out, what he did to young players and veterans was horrific. He destroyed them mentally. Um, and it's really sad. And I'm just hoping that these kids don't get abused by torts because he has that reputation. Those are the guys I'd watch for. And, and again, just my favorite to watch is going to be Connor Bedard all year. All right. Good stuff. Anybody have anything else on hockey for Moose? We got to let him get to his turkey. Yeah. If you guys it, is. Don't, if, it, it, it is turkey. And I actually have to go carve. So I'm going to say good night. Uh, uh, Happy Canadian Thanksgiving. Happy Thanks Thanksgiving, for being here on holiday. We Enjoy appreciate the poutine. It, Always good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Turkey poutine. That sounds like an appetizer. 
or dessert. Okay. Guys, it's been a pleasure. I will see you all very soon. Be well. All right. See all you, right, Moose. Moose Thanks, buddy. Bye bye. Okay. See you in July. Uh, you guys, up. what do you guys? You guys think he had any idea what he's talking about, or is he just pulling all that shit out of his? I do. I think he knows. Uh, think What's he the knows. over under on him denying he picked Edmonton at the end? Of the <laughs> yeah. <season? laughs> I got it all written down this time. Uh, yeah, I, I do it. too. Over the Take Rangers. A picture of that. Put it right in your notes app, Toby. I know we know where you save your bets. <laughs> so, all right. Hey, Rooster. Let's talk a little baseball here. Yeah, you know, I think there are two really interesting stories right now in the in the playoffs the first one is the two leading mvp candidates have been held in check so far um it's not gotten as much publicity but the mets held otani to four four hits and 20 at bats with uh 10 strikeouts and the story is that the the strategy is you mean padres what i'm sorry the padres i'm sorry the padres in the last round held otani to four for 20 and their strategy was to pitch him high and tight, give him a little chin music, and apparently it shook him. So let's we'll be it'd be interesting to see if the Mets are able to pull that off with him. And of course, we've been talking about, it, and the press has been all over the fact that Aaron Judge is struggling mightily in the in this playoffs and in other playoffs. Um, against the Royals, he batted 154 in four games with Ooh. five strikeouts. That's terrible, especially coming off the season he had. For his career, he's 207 in the playoffs, even though he has a career batting average of 288. And House and I kind of talked about this a little bit today by text. It seems to me that he's a very patient hitter. He's not, he usually during the season is not swinging at bad pitches. He waits until he gets his pitch and hits it hard. And I think he feels he's such a he's such a conscientious guy. I think he feels like he needs to produce for, for the fans and he gets into the postseason and he's trying too hard and swinging way too aggressively at pitches. He would never swing at in the regular season. He just needs to calm down and get back to who he is and I, and then and he'll do well, but it's kind of interesting that both of these guys are struggling. These phenomenal hitters who were, had gigantic years this year are doing nothing in the playoffs, but their teams are so good. They keep winning. The other interesting story to me is the Cleveland Guardians bullpen is so good that under some measures, they're the best bullpen in the history of Major League Baseball. And they are so good that in their series against the Tigers, their relief pitchers pitched 64% of the innings in those games. They barely used the the starters. The starters were like, um, you know, 15% plus in some of these games that bullpen is fantastic but they're running up against the yankees bullpen that is on a lucky streak they haven't been as good during the year but they didn't give up a run against the royals so that's going to be a interesting battle um to see what do you guys think about uh your predictions yankees versus guardians mets versus dodgers well i don't i don't know if you guys are well, are following it now but uh the mets are up six to one bottom yep. of the six yeah yeah. Uh, and to your point, Rooster, Otani's 0 for 3. I heard a good stat yesterday from uh, John Smoltz. He said that Otani, uh, when he has nobody on base, is is abysmal. But when he has runners on, he was 5 for 7 in, in the series. So I, I think it kind of surprises me they keep him at leadoff if he's not performing with no runners on base. I, I would put him back in the lineup. I think I think that's going 7. Uh I think the Mets, you know, today coming back as strong as they did after getting smoked last night, nine zero. I think, I think that's going to go seven. Um, I, I actually, I've, I've got the Dodgers winning and I've got the Yankees winning, and I think we're going to see an all time World Cl- World Series classic. Mets are pesky. They're really yeah. pesky, and, and and their pitcher today is a very very good postseason story. Sean Manea, um, he was incredible against the Phillies. He obviously has been incredible against a, a monster Dodgers lineup, all from changing what was upstairs in his head and a slight change on this crossbody throw. Um, if you've been following that story, it's really interesting how he changes pitching mechanics. That's a good postseason story. But I want to follow up on what Rooster said, because I've been texting you guys that I think the story of this postseason has been about the bullpen. 
and whether or not bullpens can hold on. It turns out in that game, that decisive game five that Cleveland took down uh, Scooball and the Tigers, Cleveland pitched seven relievers in that game, which is just crazy. And talk about stats in the fan graphs, uh, top 100 war for pitchers, the best performing pitchers, Cleveland has won in the top 100, Tanner Bibby. They got hurt bad by the injury bug uh, in the season, loss, losing two of their starters, and they've relied upon their bullpen. But here's something that's really interesting that may be the difference that favors the Yankees. Cleveland had – just the way the ALDS worked out, there were multiple in-between days that the bullpen was able to rest. There's only two off days in this seven-game series with the Yankees and Cleveland. Correct, and you have the the length of the series. I mean, it's easy to run through your whole bullpen if you're in a best-of-five series, but now the best-of-seven, that's hard to do. Every, yeah, they had off every, days in the, the five-game series a after – yeah, they had off days after the first game, the second game, the fourth game, giving the bullpen a rest. They won't get it in this. And I think both of these series will go at least six games, possibly both going seven games. I don't I just don't know how the Mets Dodgers are going to play out. The Mets are so, so pesky. And this whole like it's the right time and they got the mojo. And for everything that we've been saying about the Mets, they were far and away the best team since the All-Star break. The, they've been the best team in all of baseball. Yep. And so – you know, I, I think the Yankees are going to pull this out. I, I, I think Cleveland's starting pitching is going to fail them and the bullpen's going to get tired and they don't have enough firepower in their lineup. I think we may be seeing a subway series. Yes. I really do. Yes. Wow. I think wow. a subway That's series what I'm can happen. For. That's what I'm rooting for. Wow. All right. Anything else on postseason baseball? What you got, Bison? Um, I don't, I mean, I feel a little bit like house does. I mean, I, I, I think the Dodgers are going to win that series, but I don't have any confidence against the Mets. They just have that destiny feel to them right now. And, um, you know, Lindor, we talked so much about all the MVP prospects of, of judge and Bobby Witt jr. And, uh, and Otani, we never really talked too much about Lindor, um, who's, you know, he's MVP caliber player. Well, uh, certainly lately he is. And like lately fire. he is, hit, for sure. Hit a, lead, yeah. hit a lead off Homer today to get it going. Yeah. The so, Mets I mean, version of the captain. The quintessential captain. Yeah. And so I don't know what I, – I, I tend to think the Dodgers are going to pull it out, but I'm not sure. Uh, and I, I do think the Yankees are going to pull it out. By the way, Anthony Rizzo was activated today. Pretty interesting. Oh, interesting. Well, the, the thing about the Yankees and, and just, you know, on Judge – I mean, pretty small sample size, right? I mean, what, what are we talking about? Four games? Um, because they had this the buy. Yeah, year. yeah, this year in the in the postseason. So you you finished off uh, uh, the Brewers, right, in four games? Was it the Brewers? No, the, the Royals. No, uh, Royals. the Royals, sorry, Kansas City, and, in four games. So, you know, I, I, Judge is going to be okay. I, I think Judge is going to be just fine. All right. That's what I, I got. So let's hope. All so. right. All right, Pope. Talk to us a little uh, college football. Got a, wow, got a what, minute for that? Yeah, yeah. What what a great weekend it was. Four overtime games in the top twenty-five. Uh, two games were top twenty-five teams against each other. Um, we learned some things. That, there was a question of going into what we're going to learn this week. Uh, we learned that Lincoln Riley is probably going to be in trouble pretty soon. That was a huge game. If they could have won. Uh, would have really helped him, and losing just puts him in the wrong wrong way. Penn State, still undefeated, still a long way to go, though. Ole Miss uh, goes down to LSU. LSU pulls out the overtime win. Uh, a great fourth down uh, save by uh, LSU's Nussmeyer quarterback to put him into overtime. Then they win. Uh, Brian Kelly finally wins a big game. Question mark, is LSU you know potentially going to make a run at the playoffs now? Tennessee survives. Against Florida, Florida is god awful, and you know what does that tell us about Tennessee going into uh, playing Alabama this weekend, and then uh, Illinois beat Purdue in overtime. Bama struggled uh, to beat South Carolina twenty seven twenty five. Um, arguably, uh, you know they they should have lost that game. Uh, South Carolina had the ball, a chance to win, 
uh, through an interception. Um, Kalen DeBoer is definitely uh, feeling it uh, now after the Vandy loss and the South Carolina almost lost Debacle. at home in Tuscaloosa. Uh, but all, you know, all of that can be taken care of if they take care of Tennessee third Saturday in October game Saturday afternoon up at Rocky Top. That's going to be a big game. It's not an elimination game for the playoffs, but the loser of that game is going to be in big trouble. Would we'll probably have to win out to make a playoff. Uh, but him DeBoer, if he loses that game in Tennessee after in three consecutive weeks, almost losing three consecutive games, what does it mean to Kellen DeBoer if he loses that game? It's it's going to be you know uh, that that would be tough. Two out of three games. Uh, the the comparisons between him and and a Saban team are going to be. They're already happening, but they they would just increase. I mean, he's not going to get fired. It's just going to be very uncomfortable. Uh, and Alabama at that point will realize they're probably not going to make the playoffs unless something changes big time. So, I mean, you know, Josh Heupel, I mean, this this is a huge game Saturday afternoon. Uh, but the big game of the weekend is Georgia going down to Austin uh, to play the, the most dominant team by far in college football is UT this year. Their defense has given up three touchdowns. They blew out their blood rival OU uh, at the big red, uh, the red river rivalry uh, this week. And it, it was scoreboard was probably not even as close, uh, whatever as the game was. I mean, it was a, it was a blowout by all, all dimensions. Um, game is Saturday night. Game day is going to Austin it's going to be a wild game. I got so many orange blood buddies who are just living for Saturday night. Uh, but that's going to give us a, an indication. Georgia with two losses is going to have struggle to make the playoffs also. Uh, but can can UT win? And I do look for a big UT win on Saturday night. Um, but, uh, you know, college is – Hope, is, uh, hope yeah. I got one question for you. <laughs> I've got a single ticket, 50-yard line. It's SMU versus North Carolina or Alabama <laughs> versus Auburn. Which wow. ticket are you taking? That's all, uh, the, that's all the American people want to know right now. Uh, well, I'm still taking Alabama-Auburn ticket. I mean, I would never give that I, up. I have a question for Pope, SMU too. could be ranked higher. Pope's been going through his whole spiel, and he talked, I would say, 90% of the time about the SEC. Meanwhile, there's one SEC team in the top five right now, and that's a team that it, wasn't even in the SEC a year ago. It's an import. It's an Were import. Were you ever going to talk about Oregon or Ohio State or Miami? Oh, I have that down. I just went over. I glossed over because we were going so quick. But, yeah. Ah, okay. Tell us about that game. Anybody who saw it, was that was a great game. It was a hell of a game. It was a hell of a game. Either team could have pulled it out at the end. I well, mean, the Ohio if, State if quarterback. A, yeah, if quarterback you had a half choked. a brain, you could have. Quarterback choked. Yeah, I mean, horrible. Yeah, but I, by I the think... way, did did you guys see that whole sequence with Dan Lanning and the twelve players? And does anybody think that was done on purpose? Was that intentional? One hundred percent. You do think four... so, Pope? Yeah, it cost him four seconds. Absolutely. Wow. I, mean, I in, really in fact, give the guy fact, credit. I mean, and the analysis of that is like it looks like Lanning is actually pushing the guy to get out. To be the twelfth man, it's like intentional. Like get out there to do. It wasn't a mistake. It was intentional. Interesting. Well, how could they fix a rule to? Yeah, I mean that needs to be fixed. That. Well, so wait, that so wait, 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 wait. So tell. Let's just explain to the to the listeners what the rule was and how it was used. I I, I heard about it, but so there it was ten sec. There was ten seconds left, and Ohio State had the ball, and one first, timeout. First, first Oregon called a timeout. And then out of the timeout with 10 seconds left, they ran a play that uh, was incomplete, but Oregon had 12 men on the field, which meant that the ball advanced just five yards to about the 45, 50 yard line. Uh, but it took four seconds off the clock. So it left Ohio State with only six seconds. So he basically said, I will trade five yards, which is still out of field goal range in exchange for leaving them only six seconds with no timeouts. And that's, that's the trade he made. Well, that the, was the, the way difference to fix, in the game. The way to fix that is you, you bl- like in the NFL, if you break the huddle with 12 guys, don't they blow the play dead and, ca- and call the penalty right there on mm-hmm. defense? Or is that just an offense? 
Either way, you could blow the play dead once right. there's once there's 12 men on the field, um, you know, coming in, you could blow it dead. Or you, you got to put the time back on from the previous right. play the final inside of two or minutes two, or something. Yeah, yeah, right. there, yeah. there has the to be a rule there. that you can't reward a team for doing what they did. But right. Right. if they had that four seconds, then they would have got the opportunity for about a 40-yard winning field goal. Yeah. That was All crazy. Right. It was crazy. All right. Dodgers Anything? are making a run. It's six three, first and third with one out, bottom yeah, of six. Yeah, all, all bets are off if the Dodgers Don't count come them back out. on this game. Yeah. All right. Who's got a lasso? Or I'm sorry, no, we got to do punchable face first. Who's got a punch? Anybody? I've got one. Oh, good. Okay. You have one house? You want to go first? No, I already punched him. I already punched uh, Sirianni. All right. I'm gonna a pun- I'm gonna punch the Associated Press for their preseason college basketball rankings uh oh they're coming out with kansas number one which they did again last they did last year at this time and of course kansas didn't even make it to week two of uh, march madness they've got alabama a team that is so not a basketball program that even pope is not on their bag bandwagon they were very good last for, year for basketball yeah, final is no- four last year number two and freaking UConn, which is going for a three-peat at number three. There's, there's so much UConn hate out there. It's, it's a disgrace. It's They're a number disgrace. Three. They should be number one. They were number one at the end of the last two seasons. Oh they should be number one to start this one. It's a That's disgrace. Hilarious. That's hilarious. Okay. Wow, it's quite a All punch. Right. Any other punches? Don't That's... you have one? No, Bison? I don't think so. You're not going to punch. Not, you're not going to punch Nate Silver. Oh, uh, no, I'm not going to put him. That was such a dumb tweet, though. He deserves it. That was a stupid tweet. It was like, show me show me you don't know anything about what's happening in sports without saying you don't know how anything's happening in sports. That was terrible. For our, for our fans, Nate Silver dumped all over D.C. sports saying that they're a pathetic sports city. Yeah, they're but punching it wasn't, below their weight. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. It, there's a good argument there. It was the fact that he was blasting, like, the commanders and saying the caps were the only thing carrying the water. Like, that's just not accurate. Like that is just not accurate. So, I mean, if you're going to say we're a shitty sports town and all our teams are punching below their weight, at least get it right. That's all. That's all I'm saying. All right. Who's got a last though? I, I got one. Um, I think I got to, got to give a, a lasso to Jessica Campbell, who has become the first um, full-time NHL female assistant coach. Uh, 32 years old, hired by the Seattle Kraken, and is on the bench this year as the first uh, full-time female assistant in the NHL. So I think that's a good story. Good for her. Great story. It's a great story. Anybody else got a lasso? Buzzer beaters. House, what do you got? I got a shout out to our great armed forces, and particularly the very, very real college football teams of army and navy who for the first time since 1960 are both ranked in the top 25 with army at 23 and navy at 25 these teams are legit navy has a very very good offense army has one of the best defenses in the entire country and a pretty good offense to boot the army navy game this year is going to be electric nice that is fun. Rooster, you got one? Uh, a buzzer? Yeah. Well, I don't have a buzzer. I do have a pour out that I'd like to do. I got a buzzer, and then we'll do a pour out. Go ahead. Uh, we go back to F1 Racing this week down in yes. Austin. Yes. At the Coda. And uh, Lando's trailing uh, Max by 78 points. Can he start closing the gap? Uh, it's going to be fun to watch the guys. It's feels like it's been a while since we've had a race and it's going to continue to be a great season. I'll give a quick buzzer uh, sticking with the running theme that Rooster's going to make fun of me about, <laughs> but congratulations to Sam Chalanga oh my and, God, to, my God. and to Elizabeth Sullivan, the two winners, men's and women's of the army 10 miler, 28,000 people <laughs> showed up to run the course yesterday and I would highly recommend everyone do it. It's an amazing course. And also uh, when, the, right when the, when the wounded warriors go out first uh, it's pretty breathtaking uh, to, to see those, those competitors out there too. So that's my, that's my buzzer beater. Way to go Bison and Tracy for finishing that one. That was great. Job. Rooster, Rooster, give us your pour out. 
Uh, last week on the eighth, uh, we lost a legend in Major League Baseball, El Tiante, Luis Tiant, died at age 83. Um, he played 19 years in the Major Leagues and then became a Red Sox announcer doing the uh, Spanish uh, radio for many, many years. Uh, he was such a character and had so many inventive deliveries um, where he would like do the graduated down you know move with his glove and then turn his back and look up at the sky people forget though early in his career he was a hell of a pitcher uh he in 1968 was 21 and 9 for the year came in fifth for the mvp and had a 1.60 era uh for cleveland he was then traded to Minnesota, where he just didn't didn't have a very good 1969, 1970, and then traded to the Red Sox in 1971. Had a 1.91 ERA for the season. Career wise, he he had 229 wins and a 3.3 ERA, and none other than my man, the straw that stirs the drink, Reggie Jackson, called him the Fred Astaire of baseball. He was so fun to watch pitch. I mean, you know, you think Mark Fidrich and uh, sometimes even uh, Nestor Cortez have some interesting antics on the mound and delivery styles. None of it compared to Louis Tion. He was so fun to watch. It was it was beautiful. So uh, rest in peace, El Tiante. Nice one. That's a good one. Are you guys, anybody got anything else? All right. We'll have uh, we got another NFL game tonight. We've got some more baseball postseason. We will be back next week to see have a good if week. the Eagles see you, Nick. and Cowboys still have head coaches. See you guys. See you. Yeah. Good question. Later.